Psalm 23 is arguably the greatest poem ever written. 55 words in the Hebrew, which means that there is a center point in the psalm. The center point in that psalm is you referencing the Lord. Psalm 23 uh, is bookended by uh, the name of Yahweh. Yahweh only appears twice in the entire psalm. Yahweh, the Lord is at the beginning, and surely I will dwell in the house of the Lord Yahweh at the end. Uh, The the psalm is written in such a way that we might see um, that God is with us in the beginning of our days, in the middle of our days, and at the end of our days. It's why um, any reference of Psalm 23, even hearing the words, the Lord is my shepherd, uh, brings back a flood of memories. It may be the memory of one of your grandparents uh, teaching you that psalm, then reciting it from their memory. It might be uh, the memory of one of your parents right before bed uh, teaching you how to pray and reciting the psalm. It may be a memory of a difficult time in your life. Maybe it was at the memorial service of someone that you love when those words were turned to for guidance and prayer. The psalm journeys with us. It finds us in every season of our life and it reveals both comfort and hope, but it also reveals the assurance of the promise of a God who journeys with us through it all. It's uh, what has led Walter Brueggemann, the famed Old Testament theologian, to say that it's almost pretentious to comment on Psalm 23. Brueggemann says, uh, it preaches itself, just leave it alone. I'm going to try to heed his advice this morning. I'm going to try to let Psalm 23 do the heavy lifting of the sermon. But I'm going to try to uh, follow the structure and the order that Psalm 23 provides the beginning, the middle, and the end. Uh, As we turn to our scripture lesson this morning, I want to invite you to recite Psalm 23 with me. Uh, If you're new to faith, you can find uh, the text in your pew Bible right in front of you. But I'm going to pause here and say, this is going to be one of those moments that is going to reveal um, where and when you grew up. If um, you grew up in a time where the Lord's Prayer was forever and always known in the King James Version, go for it. We need you to recite it in that version. For those of you who grew up uh, maybe in a different time and you knew it through the NIV, you go ahead and just recite that version. It'll be like the whole debt debtor situation um, at a wedding. We'll make room for one another. Got it? No one's going to trespass on one another. Let's try it. Ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou bearest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup, oh, I like it. Surely and good, surely. All the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. I got really confused up here because I heard um, all of them blended together and I lost it in my head. (laughs) And I also want this moment to um, also reveal that those who say Presbyterians don't know their Bible. We did a really good job. No one, there are a lot of people just looking up reciting. Well done. Um, As we prepare to hear the word proclaimed, let us pray. Hover here. Hover here in the sanctuary, O God, just as you hovered over the waters of creation. Reach across the ages and breathe new life into these ancient words, that they would be your word to us here and your word to us right now. And breathe new life, O God, into the words of my mouth and into the meditations of all of our hearts, that all would be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. For we pray in Christ's holy name. 
Amen. Part one, the divine shepherd who is there at the beginning of our journey. I learned this week of a little girl uh, whose mother began to teach her the 23rd Psalm every night before she went to bed. The mother would uh, recite Psalm 23 right after bedtime prayers were given. After several weeks, um, her little girl said, Mommy, I have a really important question to ask you. And the mom said, sure, what is that? And the little girl said, Mommy, why do you say the same poem every night? about a shepherd that I shall never want. And the mom said, well, what do you mean? And the little girl replied, you have said every night, the Lord is my shepherd that I shall not want. Why do I not want this shepherd that you keep talking about? And the mom chuckled and she said, no, honey, it means the Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. Maybe you'll understand a bit more when you're older. I have to tell you, I love the little girl's question because um, it reveals in the beginning that if we uh, grow up in a stable and a safe environment, much of our early days are spent building a sense of independence that is essential to our maturation. I mean, we want to do it our way. Especially as Americans, uh, we can um, have a great sense of value on being able to do things ourselves, to be independent. We don't need anyone's help. One of the Ruffner children was known to say it this way about a thousand times a day. I do it myself. They didn't want anyone's help for anything. In the beginning, In the earliest stages of our uh, development, spiritual, emotional, physical development, the idea of a shepherd that is walking with you, guiding you, and creating places of transformation can sound almost suffocating. It can sound almost more like a nuisance than a word of comfort. But the shepherd is with us from the beginning of our days, even if we're totally unaware of the shepherd's presence, and even if we want nothing to do with the shepherd, the shepherd from the beginning wants everything to do with us. Part two, the divine shepherd who is with us in the middle of our journey. You live enough life, and what once sounded suffocating can begin to sound like the greatest gift that you could ever receive. I grew up a Presbyterian, First Presbyterian Church, Aiken, South Carolina. And I'm sure that uh, Psalm 23 was uh, read aloud from the pulpit or the lectern uh, throughout my childhood. But I have to tell you, um, I will never forget the first time I really heard Psalm 23. One of my uh, friends recited it aloud. I have no idea what prompted him to do so. We were on a hike in Hitchcock Woods and he recited it from the old... English from the King James. And when he got to, and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. I have to admit that I was utterly spellbound. The King James took my breath away. So much so that I went home that night and I uh, found my study Bible. I opened it to Psalm 23 and I began memorizing that Psalm for myself for years. Psalm 23 were the last words I would say aloud before I went to sleep. As I grew older, I came to know the the gifts and the promise that is found in Psalm 23 that um, you in fact don't stand on the edge of this life and stare into the vast unknown and have to go about it by yourself that you in fact aren't as independent as you claim that you were, that you did in fact need a guide, that a shepherd is the greatest comfort you could ever ask for. I came to learn that um, journeying this life alone is not the way that God intended for us to journey, that the good shepherd Jesus 
not only is with us, but is looking out for us. And that when we uh, journey the, the dark valleys, and when we encounter enemies in this world, those are places not that we have to win at all costs, but those are the very places where transformation happens. I came to know that that promise is almost too good to be true. The middle passage of life reveals that the many twists and turns and U-turns that life will require of us. And it's a great comfort to know that the future path is not one that we are merely to survive. But our future journey is a journey with Jesus the shepherd. And that every phase of our journey is the very place of divine encounter transformation, and formation. Part three, the divine shepherd who is with us at the end of our journey. This past Friday, um, I received a text message from a family member of a longtime church member here at Preston Hollow. She wanted to know if I could uh, come by and visit. Her mom had been under hospice care for the last several months, and uh, she sensed that her mother was beginning to make that transition uh, in that liminal space between this world and the next. She asked if I could uh, just pop by, visit, have a quick prayer. I said, absolutely. As we uh, gathered around the bed, uh, we began to talk uh, about 98 years of life. And the 23rd Psalm came up. And she said, you know, my mom had a holy trinity in her life. Every day of her life, she would recite Psalm 23, the serenity prayer, and a prayer from Thomas Merton. Every day of her life. We began um, to recount stories of what 98 years of life revealed. We began to laugh and we began to cry, even at one point, sort of startling everyone in the room with our laughter. As we uh, knelt our heads to pray, it occurred to me that all the verbs in Psalm 23 that were future tense for this person were turning into past tense verbs. That we could see at the end of this person's life the promise of God that had been present with her every day of her life. It was true in the beginning, it was certainly true in the middle, but it was at the end that we could see it. I got to tell you, um, I got in the car and um, I drove away and I did something that I. Uh, often never do. I turned the radio off and I drove, drove home in silence, buoyed by that sense of uh, holiness, of awe and wonder of what it was like to straddle that liminal space. And as I drove back to my house, it occurred to me that we don't have to be in our final days to come to see the power and the truth of this claim in our own lives. We need not be gathered around a bedside to see this truth. We need only to look back on our lives to see how this good shepherd has been with us. This morning, um, if I asked you to pull out your cell phone and I asked you to open to the photos section of that phone, and if I asked you to click all photos, you know, the one that makes all the pictures super tiny, and if I asked you to take five swipes up on that cell phone, and then if I said stop and I asked you to put your finger right on the middle of your screen and it would pull up one image, and if I asked you what do you see in that photo, I bet you would see something now that you could have never seen then. Some of you uh, know this to be true because you're about to uh, usher one of your little ones off to college. 
And that picture would have been a picture of when they were 12 or 13, when you were ready to just pull every last hair out of your head because of them. And you look at that picture now and you think, they made such a mess that day. I would give anything to go back and to clean it up one more time. It might be a, a picture of um, someone that you love. It might be a parent or, or a brother or sister. It might be a picture of your spouse. It might be a, a photo of um, that hospital room where you spent five nights in a row in that chair that was supposed to recline all the way back, but it didn't recline all the way back, and it hurt your back for weeks, and it was a picture of that room, and you look back on it, and all you can see now is the gift of time with someone that you love. It might be the image of you before um, you sought the journey to recovery. And you look back on that image and all you can see is a person who was trying to hold their life together and keep it together at all costs. And you can look back on that image and you can think, I was powerless then, powerless now. I'm just aware of it, I'm so grateful. It might be the um, picture of a plate of food <laughs> at a restaurant on a Tuesday night. And in that plate of food, you might see that that table was the joyful feast of the people of God, that it was at that table where bread was broken and cup was poured out that you knew the Holy Eucharist of what it means to share life with one another. I don't know what that image in your phone would be, but I do know this, my dear friends. Looking back, you would see the promise of a shepherd who had been with you the whole time. This week, I want to invite you um, to do that exercise. I want you to take your phone and I want you to swipe through and select a picture every day, a different picture. And then I want you to uh, go to the text and I want you to change all of the verbs in Psalm 23 to past tense. And I wonder what you might see. We're going to practice right now. I want you to take an image from your past. It could be from your phone. It could be from an old photo album, I want you to put it in your mind's eye, and I'm going to read Psalm 23 in a different way, and I wonder what you see in your life and in that moment. The Lord was my shepherd. I was actually never lost. I never wanted for a thing. In fact, I lacked nothing. I was taken care of. The Lord made me lie down in some green pastures of abundance and vitality that I didn't even know were possible. And the Lord led me beside still waters of nourishment and new life and renewal. The Lord restored my soul, replenished it, revived it, dare I say, made me whole. The Lord led me in paths of righteousness, of virtue. My life took on a greater purpose than its own in his name's sake. And yeah, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death and turns out I had not a thing to fear because I learned that God was not only with me, but God went before me. And when I stumbled into that dark valley, God was the one who caught me when I fell in. For the deepest darkness was not the place of death, but it was actually the place of life. I feared no evil because it turns out there was nothing to fear except for fear itself, they say. The Lord's rod and staff comforted me, uh, pulled me back on the right path more times than I can count. Uh, that staff made the way clear when I couldn't see a way forward. The Lord prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I mean, the walls that I thought were permanent that meant that I could never be in relationship or I could ever love again, those walls were broken down like bread broken at this table. And it was at the table in the presence of my enemies that my eyes were opened to your presence, O oh God. And it showed me time and time and time again that we do belong to one another. And Lord, you anointed my head with oil 
and you claimed all parts of me, even the parts that I didn't want to claim for myself, and my cup spilled over and over and over, and it turns out there was more grace and more mercy than I ever thought was possible, and goodness and mercy, they not only followed me, they pursued me. They were relentless. Every single day of my life, goodness was on my heels. And I dwelled in the house of the Lord all my life long. I always had a home in you, Lord, because I was always welcome in your home. For that is where I live. For I was and I am forever home in you. Looking back on it from the ending, we can see what has been true with us from the very beginning, that the divine shepherd has been with us and will guide us and accompanies us our whole lives long. May we begin to walk into this week with a new awareness so that we might see the Good Shepherd and trust that He is with us now. Will you pray with me? Awaken us, O God, to your presence that we might come to know that every moment of our life is a holy place. For there's no place that we can go where we are not with you. So thank you for the gift, O oh God, of being a God who journeys with us. For we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.